And that's the truth, that Jesus' love is, whatever word you want to put on it, all-consuming, all-powerful, mighty, reckless, lavish, abounding, abiding, never-ending, never-failing. The love of Jesus is all-powerful. It's everything. It's everything. And my heart's cry today is that you would know the love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for you today, personally, right now, in this moment, that you'd have an encounter with Papa, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, wherever you are, in your kitchen, in your bedroom, in your front room, watching it in your car, whatever that looks like, would you know the love of God? Amen. Great. Well, in a, mo- in a moment, I'm going to welcome Stuart up uh, to share a message from God's Word. But before we do that, I just really want to say uh, thank you for everyone who's given in to our Thanksgiving offering that we had a couple of uh, weeks ago, just before Easter. And we're going to use some of that money to um, have a grace fund in the church where those that are struggling with economic hardship can apply. And if you need to access some of that funds because of what's happened in this moment, please do speak to Pete or Tim and they will help you. And kind of Pete, Tim and myself are working out that fund. So we'll be giving more information about how you can access that in the coming weeks. And I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who's given into the Thanksgiving offering. So far, we've, the total is just under £11,000, which is amazing. So thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for being the body of Christ together. That's really good. Um, just some good news that I wanted to share. We're working out, as, as the whole world is, how to do church online. And one of the key things is working out how to connect and actually who we're connecting with. And I just want to let you know that every one of our Sunday services has about... 100 to 150, sometimes a little bit more, people watching the whole service. So whether they watch it right now, live at 10.30, or later on in the day, there's a a lot of people joining in. And sometimes we're even getting up to the 200 mark. And what's really exciting about that is a lot of those people live in our local area. Some of them live in our regional kind of area. Some of them live further away in the UK. And there are at least seven other nations engaging with our service really regularly and on three different continents. So it's great to be part of a global family. And if you're checking in from Cyprus or whether you're checking in from Poland or Kosovo or Kenya or India, um, as I've seen over the coming weeks, I just want to say hi. It's great to have you with us. You're so welcome. And it's a privilege to do church with you uh, online. If you'd like to connect more with the Community Church wherever you are in the world, please do head over to our website, thecommunitychurch.online. Fill in the contact page, and we'd love to help you to connect to the church more. Each Friday, we send out a weekly email, and part of that email just says what's going on in the life of the church, events that are coming up, or meetings that are happening over Zoom. And a new part of that um, email that we're now doing is what we call Family Hub News. And so people are just sharing stories of maybe how they've cleaned their shed, uh, what they've done with their kids, where they've been for a walk. It doesn't have to be anything spiritual, just, just purely relational so we can keep that connection up. And one of the key things that we'd like to do this week is we'd love to, uh, you to take part in a quiz where there's tons of baby photos and then adult photos and to, to match them up. And if you want to find out where that is, that's on our weekly email. It's a link called the Family Hub News. And if you've got stuff that you want to share, please do email that to Chris Clegg directly if you know her email or to office at thecommunitychurch.online and it will come through to me and the other staff team members and we'll get that to Chris. And the final piece of news, two more pieces of news before I invite Stuart up is Greg and Leanne are starting a new small group called Live Worship, which will be starting on a Tuesday night. Details are on the website. And tonight, 8 till 9 p.m., we have our church prayer meeting on Zoom, and Dave Bichino will be hosting that. So I'm going to welcome Stuart up. I'm going to get down off the stage. I'm going to move the camera. It's going to be a bit shaky, and then we're going to get Stuart going, okay? God bless you. Uh, can I just say it's not uh, me that's being shaky, it's the camera. Um, yeah, so there's a bit of a first. I've preached quite a number of times, uh, particularly in my uh, role with Wycliffe Bible Translators, but this is the first staring at a camera. But actually, I was kind of thinking about this and uh, chatted to a few friends, and they said, well, why don't you imagine that you're kind of sucked like some sort of Steven, Steven Spielberg film into the camera, so I'm now in your front lounge with you or maybe you're sitting in the garden on the patio enjoying this glorious weather 
and um, it's just really, really good to connect with you. As I say, it's the first for me, but hey, who would have ever thought that we would be in a situation like we're in right now? And um, I want to talk today about balance. We've been trying to um, give sermons, give talks, share in a way that's really, really pertinent to your situation, to look in, to see how God's there for us, and then also just to see how we can lean into God and mine into the things that God's got for us. So, um, as Dave said, my name is uh, Stuart. I'm one of the leaders at uh, the church here. My nine to five is working with Wycliffe Bible Translators, and I'm part of a European team that gets alongside national mission leaders around Europe to work out how they are going to fulfill their great commission and how they can help churches in their countries to do that, whether that's right over in the very east in Russia or in Poland, and then we go right the way through to the Republic of Ireland. One of the standout things for me during this time, because I try to balance the difficulties and the changes with the positives, is that I've seen more of my friends face to face, face to face through Zoom and Skype and WhatsApp uh, video than I did before. And I just want to say greetings to all of you. A lot of them threatened or encouraged me and said, we'll be watching you. So I know I'm going to get some good critiquing of this sermon. And I want to thank you guys for the privilege of invading your space, your living rooms, and your current context. So, as I said, we felt as a leadership that we really wanted to focus um, on some of the ways that we can manage through this current weirdness. And I'm just going to open up the subject of balance and I think it's good to have a balanced and godly walk through COVID-19, through lockdown, through change, and for a growing number of people through the pain at the loss of jobs, of loved ones, and of dreams. My work with Wycliffe means that I do get to connect with lots of people from all around the world, in all cultures, and being a balanced person is something that is highly prized in every culture that I've ever come in contact with. Whether that's Congo, Kinshasa, China, Chile, or Croydon. In every single context, having a balanced attitude and a balanced response to life seems to be really, really important. So, we're going to do three things. I'm going to take balance from three angles, and I'm going to do that by answering or attempting to answer three questions. First of all, why coronavirus didn't take God by surprise, and where is he in all of this? Second, what does God have to say, and what does he have to offer people as they seek to find balance during the huge transition and this massive reset button that's been pressed for the whole of the world. And thirdly, how do we as individuals find balance? And with each three of these questions, these three different angles, I'll be taking three different passages from the Bible. Two from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. So let's have a look at our first point. Why Corona didn't take God by surprise, and where is he in all of this? And I want to make as well three sub-points on um, this whole passage. First, the Bible, the word of God, is very clear that trouble and joy will come. That things won't and they don't stay the same. So, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to a book called Ecclesiastes. And it's kind of pretty easy to find. So, if you take your Bible and you kind of open it in the middle, you're almost certainly going to land on the Psalms. And actually, Ecclesiastes 
is another two books down the line. So you go um, after Ecclesiastes, there's Proverbs, and then there's the Song of Solomon. Or actually, I think Ecclesiastes is before the Song of Solomon, but you can put a comment on Facebook and I may decide to notice it or I could just ignore it. But Ecclesiastes 3 is part of a genre in the Bible called wisdom literature. A lot of the wisdom literature is accredited to Solomon, and Solomon says this, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. There's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Now, a couple of nuggets of wisdom that I have gleaned along the way is that we are wired, we are created to respond. An activity or a response to situations we find ourselves in are both totally normal. Immediately, the transition was forced on us, and actually I, I have quite fast responses to situations Um, If I'm close by and you knock a glass off the table, there's a good chance I'll grab it before it hits the floor. That's just the way my mind and my body works. And immediately that the transition was forced on us, I really struggled to make the best of the changes, to make the best of the slowdown, to make the best of the enforced house arrest. And that's kind of normal. But I have come to experience and enjoy things in the slowdown, the walks along the Thames. The things that matter to me are still out there despite the change. Of course, my light and temporary discomforts are as nothing compared to those who are seriously ill with COVID-19 or are in their nothing compared to people who are in long and potentially difficult emotional convalescences. For those people who've lost loved ones, and most poignantly, for those who are on the front line treating the suffering, the ill, and the dying, these discomforts of mine are light. But Ecclesiastes 3 says to us that there is a time for everything. And consequently, there will be a broad range of responses to each situation. The second nugget that I've gleaned is that the real wisdom is not about explaining away our lockdown. And it's not about ignoring it. I think the wisdom is to accept it and own it. Now, the Bible has a technique that's called Lament. And there's actually another book beyond Ecclesiastes, which is literally called Lamentation. The Psalms are also full of lament. You read Psalm 6, you read Psalm 13, and if you're a Christian, you'll know the famous words of Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is a direct quote from Psalm 22. Now, the good news is that not only are we supposed to lament, but God wants to hear us in full voice as we navigate this situation. He wants to hear us in full voice for our situations. He also wants us to be in full voice for the son or the daughter, the friend, the work colleague, or the member of the youth group who strayed away from him. He wants us in full voice with the fact that life is generally pretty hard for 95% of the population of this planet. And he definitely wants us in full voice as we talk about and as we think about the injustices in this world, which means that 1% of the population owns 95% of things. 
that if you live in Mozambique, your average life expectancy is 42, and if you live in Japan, it's 82. So my second sub-point is that God is very clear in the Bible that he wants to hear us in full voice now and at all times, and that it is our right and what God, as a good father, has crafted to be the very fabric of our being. Third sub-point is that God laments himself. God is not some out-of-the-way uh, you know, I'm in control and I'm all cool and candid and calm about everything. But God makes it clear that through the Bible, he too is in anguish. In Genesis, the first book in the Bible, we hear that God is grieved to his heart. He's grieved to his heart by the violent wickedness of people. St. Paul, in the New Testament, talks about the fact that the Holy Spirit is groaning within us. He becomes the dynamo within our lives. And that Jesus showed more emotion towards the plight of people than we would maybe expect. The God-man Jesus shows incredible control and balance throughout his ministry. But when he gets to Lazarus, or to Lazarus's tomb because he heard that his friend had died, Jesus weeps bitter tears. That's the God of the Bible. The Holy Spirit that groans, the Savior that weeps bitter tears, and the God that is in anguish because of the violent wickedness of this world. So let's just remember that and take comfort that God is actually with us. He weeps, he grieves, and he's anguished for us with our hopes, our dreams, our routines, our choices, and the loved ones that are taken from us. My second angle or question to remind you was what does God have to say and what does he have to offer people as they seek balance in this huge transition? And I'm going to read from Isaiah 33. I really like Isaiah. It's a meaty book. There are some really, really hard bits of clarity in there. But actually, many, many of the chapters have prophecy which still speak to our hearts and to our minds, to our lives and to our situations 2,500 years after Isaiah was inspired by God to write this stuff down. This is what Isaiah 33 says. Woe to you, destroyer, you who have not been destroyed. Woe to you, betrayer, you who have not been betrayed. When you stop destroying, you will be destroyed. When you stop betraying, you will be betrayed. Lord, be gracious to us. We long for you. Be our strength every morning, our salvation in time of distress. At the uproar of your army, Lord, the peoples flee. When you rise up, the nations scatter. Your plunder, O nations, is harvested as by young locusts. Like a swarm of locusts, people pounce on it. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with his justice and righteousness. He will be the sure foundation of, for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. Look, their brave men cry aloud in the streets. Look, um, sorry, the envoys of peace weep bitterly. The highways are deserted. No travelers are on the roads. Now, these few verses contain this amazing mix of crystal clear clarity and a few deep comforting promises. 
Of course, I don't need to go into the betrayal or the destruction or the uproar that we're actually already all too familiar with in our world. But I did have an eyebrow-raising moment when I got to verse 8 and heard that the highways were deserted and that there were no travellers on the road. I took Karis to her job, her summer job at Tesco this morning, and I made High Wycombe in record time, only seven and a half minutes, not a car on the road. And I do want to shout out to the poor BMW driver who was copped by a police telephone, uh, a police helicopter camera um, doing 150 on the A11 at 12 o'clock in the morning. I have to say, mate, it's just a real disappointment, A, that you were able to do that speed on a midday, busy, normally busy motorway, but also the fact that you got copped. Um, We aren't going to be offering any of our um, fund for corona to the guy just to put everyone's um, minds at ease and your hearts at rest. But isn't it amazing that Isaiah wrote two and a half thousand years ago and the fact that highways were deserted and that there were no travelers on the road was also something that was common to his context. So what was his context? Well, Isaiah, one of the most amazing prophets of all time, was with a people that had gone into exile. And they'd gone into exile because they just hadn't done what God had asked them to. But actually, I want to focus this morning on the promise. I want to focus on where God is at in this situation and where he wants to be in our own lives. Verse 5 says this, The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with his justice and righteousness. So, God is exalted, and he is in the process of bringing justice and righteousness. The exaltedness speaks positively of his otherness. He is actually above it all. He is above this. This did not take him by surprise. But his purpose is to fill Zion, to fill his church, and to fill his people with righteousness, and to bring justice. Verse 6 goes on to say, He will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. And as we dial this purpose or mandate down, to the effects that this has for us, we are encouraged to see that God is the sure foundation. How often during the last four or five weeks have you cried out to God? And how have you heard him responding? How often have you prayed the silent prayers and been amazed at how he has responded to you? Verse 6 talks about God being a rich storehouse of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. Aren't they amazing things that if we had those in our toolbox from today, wisdom, knowledge, salvation, we would be so much better able to work well and to do these things well. This is what brings balance knowing that God is a rich store of wisdom, salvation, and knowledge. I want to um, unpack um, a final verse, um, and it kind of carries on, in a sense, into my third question. So let's just remind ourselves of the third question, and that was, um, how do we find balance? And the segue is between God being that rich storehouse of justice, wisdom, and salvation, and then how we go after this. And I'm now going to come to the New Testament and pick up on some verses in Matthew 6. 
Now, the great beauty of a smartphone is you can scroll through very quickly, but if you have a paper Bible, Matthew is the first gospel in the New Testament, and it was written by one of the guys who was actually an apostle, a follower of Jesus, one of his very first disciples, a guy called Matthew with a very dodgy backstory, but somebody who found Jesus and found salvation, and then was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write out a reasoned argument for Jesus' life. And chapters 5 and 6 take us into what is commonly called the Beatitudes, but it's actually simply the first set of teaching that Matthew puts together that Jesus had taught. And I'm going to take up Um, this specific point from Matthew 6, verse 28. Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or when shall I turn the page over? No, sorry. Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So that's our landing point. Our landing point is that God has been in and through and wasn't surprised that coronavirus came our way. That scripture is full of um, uh, words and books that talk about who God is and how God is a God of balance. And thirdly, that when we press into God, when we seek first the kingdom of God, all the other things will be added to us. Now, some of you listening may not know Jesus as Savior. Some of you may know Jesus as Savior, but think even maybe on a daily basis, I I just keep blowing it. And some people will say, yeah, I've known Jesus uh, for a long time now, but I'm still finding these times incredibly tough. And we're going to just spend some time in prayer. We're just going to spend some time just being silent before our God. We're just going to spend some time allowing God to speak into my preparation and into my spirit so that I can actually speak words of life and hope and balance over you. So let's just pray. Just take time to be silent before God. Let's just take time to get close. Let's just take time to allow God in our moment's mental quiet to come rushing in and to meet us at our point of need. If you don't know Jesus as Savior, and yet, as I started to pray, you felt this unexplicable and overwhelming sense of peace, I want to give that peace a definition. That's the presence of God in your lives. And I just want to pray, becoming a Christian is dead easy. It just says, God I've often thrown the spare wheel of my life in your direction and asked you to fix a puncture. But actually, Lord, I'm getting out of the driving seat now. 
and I want you to have the steering wheel of my life. I want to accept this incredible offer that Jesus made when he died on the cross for my sins, for my shortcomings, for my failures, for my fears. And I want to say, Lord, here's the steering wheel of my life. Would you, would you guide me? Would you drive me? Would you be the one to set the speed? Because actually, my car isn't just a steering wheel. There are, there are wheels to it. There's a body. There's an interior. And a number of us, too, are feeling, whoa, a bit battle-weary. This is getting hard and yet we know Lord God in our hearts and in our heads that you are a treasure store of salvation knowledge and truth and we make the decision today to walk into truth we make the decision today Lord to walk into knowledge and we make the decision today to walk deeper into the territory within which we live, which is called salvation. And finally, I just felt um, the Lord gave me a few words of knowledge for people. Our first word of knowledge was that in this new context, our failures and our shortcomings may become more obvious to us, but God has put treasure into jars of clay. That was always his intention. So I'm just saying, be nice to yourself. And there is plenty of scripture that I could apply into um, that um, just truism there. I believe too that the Lord said that even in this special time, he is mending the brokenhearted. And you will know what that means. That despite what is going on around you, the Lord is using this time to mend your heart. To take away a broken heart and to give you a new heart which can beat vitally and beat well. And finally, the Lord is using this time to raise the broken to life. Nothing gets past God and nothing is too hard for him. And we praise you, Lord, that you can be all of those things that we've prayed and that we've believed in these few short minutes. In the name of Jesus, amen. So guys, that was the end of my first. I hope that I did an okay job and I get to do a second couple of bits of housekeeping. We will be ending the service as soon as I'm done and Dave switches off. But um, if you responded to um, the gospel today, there is a poll that you can follow specifically through Facebook. Feel free to do that. And please, as we've said before, if you are in Russia, if you're in Kosovo, if you're in Manila, in the Philippines, wherever you are, just use uh, our Facebook page and just say, hey, it was a great service, or at least Dave's singing was good. Uh, Because we'd love to connect with you, and we just want to pray and want to get alongside you, because we can do that. And finally, I just hope you have a great week. Um, So every blessing and see you again soon. Bye. Are we all off? Happy with that?